I'm your typical 21-year-old American girl. I grew up in the suburbs and had a pretty nice upbringing. Unfortunately, I had been a total party girl up until the time I turned 20. That was when I started getting my stuff together. I nearly died of alcohol poisoning one night and despite being surrounded by some of my friends, nobody even bothered to help me. Even when it was obvious that something was wrong, I'm not going to lie to you, I was a really crummy person when I was younger. One of the things I remember doing with my friends was teasing a really unpopular kid. I get asked out by a fair amount of guys and I'm not the ugliest girl in the world. My friends and I all had an Algebra 2 class towards the end of high school and one of the boys in it always seemed to be checking me out. I really regret being mean and teasing him because he was honestly a pretty nice kid, just kind of socially awkward and completely lacking in any sense of fashion or style. One day after class, my friends and I were talking about a party for that weekend. He must have been listening in on our conversation because he came up to me and asked if I needed someone to go to the party with. I don't really know what he was expecting, but I went with it on a whim. I told him that I really needed a nice guy to go with me so people would think I have a boyfriend. He agreed to go with me and said that he would pick me up before the party. We exchanged phone numbers and that was that. My friends and I were already plotting on how we were going to embarrass him on the night of the party. I told him that it was a professional party. He told me that he had to go out and buy a tuxedo then. Me, being the horrible person I was back then, totally agreed. He picked me up in his mom's car before the party on Friday night. He even brought me flowers. It was at that point that I started to feel guilty and kind of wanted to abandon the whole thing. I couldn't do it though. My friends would have been really mad at me. They got two giant tubs of mayonnaise that they were going to pour on top of him. It was my job to have him stand for a picture and get him in the right position. Then, I will tell them that I had to go to the bathroom real quick and for him to stay in place, and that's when my friends were going to pour the mayonnaise on him. Again, I regret that whole role I played in this whole thing. I even felt guilty at the moment when I walked away, and I actually went to the bathroom. I didn't want to watch it happen. From what I heard, he started crying and went back to his car and drove home immediately. I thought that would have sent some kind of a signal that I really wasn't interested in dating him. Well, he didn't quite get that signal, because he still kept trying to talk to me and go out on another date. He even tried asking me where I went that night and it made me feel even worse than I already did because he didn't even realize that I was in on the joke. Like he thinks he randomly got mayonnaise. As guilty as I felt, I just tried to ignore him and hope the problem would go away on its own. We only had another month or so of algebra and it was every other day, so I figured the number of times I had to see him were limited. Well, he never actually got the hint. He found me on Facebook and messaged me on there. He somehow found my phone number, which I still don't quite understand how he did it either. Suffice to know that he still regularly made an attempt to date me for a very long time. I tell you this story not for fun or to brag, but because this guy... Donald was his name, continued his interest in me for six years. Still, even to this very day, we've been out of high school for years now and he still messages me or reaches out in some way every few weeks. After I started getting my life together, I tried explaining to him that I wasn't interested in him, but he never really got the message. I work a night shift job now, at a gas station on the edge of town. For the most part, we only really ever got truckers and the occasional traveler. Anything else is pretty rare, but sometimes on certain nights, around 3 o'clock in the morning, Donald will show up, and he's not looking to get gas, he's looking to get me. It's only happened three times now, but they were honestly pretty horrifying and I nearly called the police the last time. I think I will if he shows up again. The first time he showed up where I worked, he tried pretending like it was a coincidence, like... Oh, hey, I didn't know you worked here. I was just buying one candy bar at a gas station at 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, the usual. That night was really weird. The second time he came by, he told me that it was a long drive from his house to the gas station, but he said that it was worth it because the candy bars at this gas station were the best. Bear in mind, this guy was buying plain Hershey milk chocolate candy bars every time he came in, and not in bulk either, literally just one every single time he came in. Like, 
Could you get any weirder? This last time that he came, though, that was the time that really freaked me out. He's a lot rougher now that he's been out of high school. I think he works at some kind of manual labor job, or maybe he's just a dirty person. He always looks really disheveled when he comes in. And he walked into the gas station, bought his usual chocolate bar, but instead of leaving, he just stood there. I was standing at the cash register, just kind of awkwardly waiting for him to go, but I handed him back his change and receipt and just watched him stand there and stare at me, like dead on staring me in the eye. I felt extremely uncomfortable and didn't know exactly how to end the social interaction. I asked him if he needed anything else, but he just said no and then continued staring at me. That was when he reached over the counter and tried holding my hand. I could tell by the look on his face that he had some sort of intimate intentions in his mind, something devious. As freaked out as I was, I pulled my hand back as fast as I could and told him that he had to go. Why are you going to be like that? I love chasing you, but you got to give in one day, he said to me. That was when I told him that I was not interested in him at all and the only reason I went on a date with him was because I was in on the joke to pour the mayonnaise on him. I told him that I wouldn't date him if he was the last guy on earth and that I would never be interested in him. I saw his facial expression go from nefarious to angry. He knocked a bunch of gum off of the gum rack before storming out. Before he walked out the door though, he stopped and looked me right in the eye and said, I'll have you one day, you little pretty princess. And then he left. I had no idea how to respond. I don't even know what to do about the situation. He's not really doing anything illegal, I don't think, other than knocking things over. If I see him again, though, I might have to call the police. If this isn't stalking, then it comes pretty darn close. And the part that kills me about the whole thing is that I just want to put that phase of my life behind me. I don't want to think about being popular or partying or being mean to kids like him. I just want to save up some money, get my life together and maybe find a good boyfriend but yeah, that's my ongoing situation with a very creepy guy I played a prank on from high school and looking back, I never should have gone along with it. I should have followed my intuition and done the right thing. Instead, I guess I have to pay my dues for what I have done in some way. Maybe this is some weird form of justice. I work at a regional grocery store. I'm a 26-year-old female. I graduated from college with a master's degree in psychology and still couldn't find a job. Due to family circumstances, I wasn't able to get my PhD, which was basically the bare minimum to land any decent paying job, so I was a little stuck. I even had a hard time finding a regular job. I had applied to a bunch of lower positions, but I kept getting rejected because I was overqualified. Over and over again, people told me that I would get too bored on the job, and so they wouldn't hire me. This made me livid. After a certain point, my student loan payments were due and I really needed the money. I had to ask my cousin's friend for a job. He was the manager at this regional grocery store. Literally the only position they had available was stocking shelves on night shift. I couldn't believe myself. I was so ashamed. I felt like I'd wasted years of my life and thousands of dollars in debt just to get a job anyone could do. But either way, the job itself wasn't all that bad. I was allowed to listen to my earbuds while I worked. This meant I could turn on my favorite podcast while working. My favorite murderer, if you're wondering. I must have worked there for about a year before the big change came. Previously, the store closed down at 12 in the morning, but for whatever reason, that policy got changed and it became a 24-hour store with the exception of holidays and Sunday nights. It really sucked. What used to be my podcast and stock the shelves time kept getting interrupted by stupid customers asking where things were. That was fine. I didn't mind helping people out. I worked there after all. But they would literally ask me where the most obvious grocery items were. So many times I couldn't help but think, are you literally blind or stupid? But then there was one night when a very strange man came up to me. He had really buggish eyes. Entire body was round and... 
He had the longest nose hair I'd ever seen on a human being. It was like he took the hair right off of his head and glued it into his nose. I was down on my knees stocking the bottom shelf with pickles when he touched my hair. I had my hair in a ponytail that night and he lightly caressed the part of it that was touching my back. I jerked back and asked, excuse me? He tried playing it off like he had arthritis, but I knew that he was just being a creep. I asked him what he wanted. He stood there for a second. He seemed to be thinking of what to say, but only one word came out of his mouth. You. He walked up closer to me and then started to smell my shoulder. It felt so weird and I don't think I could have been more creeped out. I told him that if he doesn't need any help finding any items, then I had work I had to be doing. But he kept standing there. He started smiling real wide and then hugged me. It's okay, darling. I'm going to take care of you. At this point, I was screaming inside of my own head. This freak was crossing a million different lines. I pushed him off of me and ran to get my manager, who was a larger guy. He'd have no problem fighting this creep if it came to it. The creepy guy followed me as I went too. The nerve on this guy. When he saw my manager down the aisle, he must have had second thoughts because he turned around and started running away. I explained to my manager everything that had happened and he said he'd take care of it if that guy came back again. And that creep was smart because he waited a couple of weeks before he did come back. He waited long enough that the incident would not be on the tip of anyone's mind. I wasn't expecting him and neither was my manager. I was standing there stocking a shelf like I always did and all of a sudden I felt someone tugging my hair. They tugged really hard and it really hurt my neck. They totally overpowered me and started dragging me across the floor. At this point, I hadn't even realized who it was until I looked up to see that man. He must have dragged me a solid 30 feet to the exit before someone saw what was going on. It wasn't my manager, but it was another one of the girls who worked with me. She started screaming like a banshee and running at him, and for one reason or another he decided to run away again. I was beyond relieved. I couldn't believe that he was just going to walk up to me and start dragging me out of the store by my hair. What kind of psycho does that? It was all just truly horrifying. This was finally the incident that convinced the store owner that we had to have security if we were going to be open at night. We had a security guard somewhere on the premises after that and I felt a lot safer. I'm still looking for a job in psychology and I really hope I can get one soon. I felt like I really needed a break after having gone through all of this. I work the overnight shift for a small organization for executive protection agents. Let's call the organization Black Tie Protection for the sake of this story. We're all ex-military police officers or highway patrolmen. In total, there are about six of us full-time and also a handful of part-timers. Essentially, we worked for a large-scale manufacturing company, but moreover, were personal armed guards for the owner and his family. They are a wealthy family in the small community, and with that, there becomes some troubles every once in a while, and that's where we step in. We ran 12-hour shifts, two guards per shift. My normal partner's name was Austin, but we all used his call sign, Coma. I know that seems weird, but long story short, this tough son of a bitch took a sniper round right in the helmet in his early service days and stood right back up to finish the fight, only to pass out after the fighting had finished and he was actually in a coma for weeks before coming to again. Needless to say, he's a good partner to have. Our normal shift consisted of one of us walking the empty building at night, while the other sits at the guard station next to the owner's huge house watching the property as well as the video camera feeds. The first of the two stories happened about a year after I started. People say that things happen when you least expect it, and that's exactly what happened. We had been doing our normal rounds and joking back and forth over the radio, 
when I received a strange call over our secured radios. There was a slurred deep voice. Can anyone hear me? I clicked the radio with the response. Coma? Is that you messing with me? He answered back quickly that it wasn't him. Then he said to whoever's on the line that it's a secure channel. After a few moments of silence, there was yet another strange call. It was the slurred deep voice again. Okay, good. You can hear me. I need you to help the person in the old house. I can't control myself for much longer. Then the radio goes silent. I immediately got back to the guard station, and both Koma and I tried multiple times to get whoever was on the radio to answer again, but there was no response. After a brief moment, the only old house we knew was the house that the owner had grown up in, and it wasn't that far off the property, and he keeps it out of nostalgia. We decided to go check it out. We got geared up and we jumped into the truck, then drove over to the old property. Now, this isn't a rundown house by any means. It was a nice two-story house. It had a really big pool in the backyard, and it was very well kept. The first thing we noticed upon arriving was that the light that's usually left on in the upstairs room was off. There was an eerie stillness in the air. We made entry, and we started clearing the room one by one, and after what seemed like an hour of stress, we had finally cleared the entire house. Looking around once we regrouped, Confused Coma then said to me, Yeah, I think this was all just a prank. And just as we were about to leave, the radio cracked on again. Once again, the slurred deep voice. Oh no, it looks like you were too late. I guess it's a good thing no one uses the pole anymore. Then silence again. We rushed down and we all looked at the pool, but nothing. Getting frustrated and feeling played, we were just about to leave, when I had spotted the pool house door was a little cracked. Using hand signs, I gestured guard up and moved towards the pool house. Upon getting to the pool house building, we burst through the door, our guns drawn, to then find something that still haunts me to this day. There was a female maybe 20 years old, and she was stabbed so many times it looked like her body was Swiss cheese. Upon finding her, I had rushed to her side while Coma held the position at the door. Now, I had combat medic experience, so I had tried to find a pulse, but I didn't find one. Upon laying her down to try CPR, I realized her head had almost been cut off. After gathering myself, I also realized there was a smile drawn in blood right on her face and the word almost written on her forehead. We called the police and we secured the scene the best we could. It took about two weeks, but we finally heard the sick person that had done this awful act was a known convict that had actually been released only days before. He had lured the poor girl into the house by claiming it was his. That drawn on smile still haunts me to this day. The scary encounter happened to me when I left my homeland of Australia. I didn't really have a choice. I had just gotten out of a very abusive two-year marriage, yet I still wasn't free from my ex-husband. It was a very painful choice to leave behind my family, as we were extremely close, as well as leaving my country Australia, but I needed to make a change for my own future happiness. Here's a little background. I'm a fitness professional and an elite athlete. I decided to move to LA, the fitness capital of the world. I packed my whole life into two suitcases and I then set off to start a new life. I was filled with excitement and anxiety and fear of the unknown. I had nowhere to live, no job or family or friends. I was on my own. I touched down in LA, checked into my hotel and started to look for a place to live and a job. I found a great apartment one street back from Melrose Avenue. It was a great location 
as I didn't have a car, so basically I just walked everywhere. After a week of handing out my resumes, I had landed a great position as a head trainer at a 24-hour gym. I was so excited. The gym was only a 25-minute walk from my apartment. My shift was from 4 p.m. to midnight, which I loved. I got to train during the day, which was perfect. I had settled in beautifully. I had made some really great friends, and I had also met a really great guy. He was from Canada. Life was finally falling into place, and it felt great. Now, coming from Australia and being raised on property life was pretty drama-free. So, walking home from work in LA at midnight, I truly never gave it much thought. Don't get me wrong, I was always careful, but I was never really worried. What an idiot I was. On this particular night, I'd stayed late, as my coworker was running late for their shift. No big deal. I left the gym and I started my walk home around 1am. Now my walk home was mostly very well lit on the main drag. However, the street I lived on was extremely dark with lots of trees. My apartment was about 200 meters down after you went off the main drag. It was a beautiful night. As I was walking home, I had noticed a very large dark skinned man standing at the bus stop. The bus stop was just before my street. This guy was about 6 foot tall and at least 300 pounds. A big guy. Now remember, I'm a fitness professional, so I know physiques, and I noticed him right away. We made some eye contact, and I instantly felt the hairs go up on my back of my neck, and I felt panicked. The guy wasn't checking me out like, oh, she's cute. Oh, no. I felt his intentions right there through that stare, and they were not good. I could feel my stomach turning and my heart was beating right out of my chest as if I had just finished the 100 meter Olympic final. As I walked right past him with a purposeful walk, I could feel his eyes boring into my soul. I didn't dare look at him again. I really didn't want any type of conversation with him or give him any opportunity to approach me. So I walked past him and with every step as I walked by, I could feel my pulse quickening. When I finally passed him, my fear only increased, as I then realized he's now behind me and I can't see him. I'm a strong fit woman, five foot seven at 135 pounds, but I'm clearly no match for a big guy like him. As I turned onto my street, the terror was now full on reality as my street is pitch black. No street lights and lots of trees, as I mentioned before. I was walking so fast now. I reached into my hip pouch and I pulled out my keys, placing them between my fingers and held on tightly. My heart was pounding in my ears. All of a sudden, I hear these really loud footsteps running up full speed behind me. I spun around to see this big huge guy standing right in front of me and I screamed out loud. He then grabbed me with both hands, clutching my clothes. I was still clutching my keys, and I had punched him in the face as hard as I could. Right at about that time, I then saw a car driving down my street towards us. The car started to flash its lights and beep the horn. This sent the big guy scrambling off, and he ran away. As the car then pulled over, I jumped back away as the person in the car then rolled down the window. I was crying hysterically. The adrenaline was pumping, and I was just trying to make sense of what had just happened. The person then told me to get in the car, that they'll drive me home. They said that they worked out at my gym, and that they recognized me. They also showed me their membership and license. And they then said, Please get in the car, I just want to help you. That guy went into the car in the alleyway. There's actually two guys, and I don't think they're done messing with you. My mind was racing as I then got into his car. I was crying so hard as the realization then washed over me of what just happened and what could have happened. I know that night I had a very special angel watching over me. That experience opened my eyes as well as my awareness to all of my surroundings. When you feel something isn't right, trust your inner voice. I'm so very glad I did. 
That night is a night that I will never forget, and the sound of those heavy footsteps will forever be etched into my brain. I don't ever want to experience anything like that again. Stay safe, and stay alert. About a year ago, in my final semester in college, I worked at a Shaw's grocery store in Boston, Massachusetts. For those of you who don't know what Shaw's is, it's basically a grocery store that's mainly based in the Northeast. I didn't have a car yet, so I mainly requested for day shifts as I've always been skeptical of the night. It wasn't that I hated them, it was more so the fear of what could happen, especially to a petite 5'7 girl like me. However, sometimes I'd be given a closing shift, much to my annoyance, as I had a 7.45am class and we closed pretty late. Whenever I did have a closing shift, we'd end up closing at 10, and it's about an hour's bus ride back home. My managers, being the jerks that they were, gave me a week of closing shifts knowing my situation. I was pissed, but whatever. It's a few hundred dollars added to my paycheck, so I couldn't argue with that. It was a Thursday night, and I had just finished stocking a few chips as we had just gotten an extra shipment. It was me, my manager, and another coworker running the register. It's about an hour before we close, and the store is pretty much dead except for a few customers. I finish putting the chips on the shelves and get ready to clock out. Before doing so, my manager had told me to go outside and bring the shopping carts that were in the parking lot to the store. Living in a decent sized city, it wasn't uncommon for careless people to leave their carts out in the open. As I'm grabbing a cart beside a car, a woman rolls down her window and says hello. With a friendly smile, I say hello back and asked if I could help her. In the car was a mom and what appeared to be her teenage daughter in the front seat. Right away, the mom seemed concerned, looking back and forth before telling me that they needed gas. I tell her there was a gas station just down the road, but she then interrupts me, asking if I could give her money for gas. She's explaining as to how she just came from another state and was in desperate need. Being a dirt poor college student, I barely made enough to pay for my own tuition. However, I didn't want to decline help to someone in need, so I take out my wallet and hand her a $5 bill. She stares down at the money and then back at me as if she wanted more when she said that it wasn't enough. I told her I was sorry, and that was all I had. She then says in a more direct tone, if I could get into her car and go down to the gas station to help her get gas. As I was about to respond, that's when I noticed the teenage daughter had been staring at me the whole time. She's sitting in the seat, giving me this dead stare while licking her lips as if she were planning on something. That was my cue to get out of there, as something wasn't right. Thankfully, my manager had come out, and when he saw the car, it immediately pulled out of the parking lot and drove off. I remember running up to him and thanking him for noticing. He also knew something was wrong, as he could definitely see the fear and panic of my face. My manager took a picture of the car and was able to identify the year and model of it. I worked at that Shaw's for a good year after that and never saw that car again. <laughs>